When my husband and I officially made our break from religion, a huge fallout ensued. We were officially marked and withdrawn from at the local church and spent the next few weeks fielding emails, calls, and inquiries concerning the path to destruction that we were headed down. We expected this and had even prepared a document of sorts detailing our thought processes that led us to the conclusion that the Bible is not the inerrant inspired word of God, but a man-made outdated tome riddled with contradictions, inconsistencies, errors, and atrocities. During our discourse with several Christians, we were shocked to hear the justifications given for some of the more grievous and brutal acts for which God was responsible. In part two of this video series, we will be discussing murder and genocide as depicted in the Bible, and the links the Christians will go to to justify it. First, let's start off with a few definitions so we're all on the same page. The word murder is defined as to kill a human being unlawfully and with premeditated malice, or to slaughter wantonly. The word genocide is defined as the deliberate and systematic destruction of a racial, political, or cultural group. Throughout time, humankind has been at war with itself. Frequently, these conflicts are over the possession of land and often use religious decree as reasoning for war. Because of the atrocities prevalent in war, man has created rules of engagement to determine punishable war crimes. In 1945, the United States and other allies developed the Agreement for the Prosecution and Punishment of the Major War Criminals of the European Axis and Charter of the International Military Tribunal, or IMT sitting at Nuremberg, which contain the following definition of crimes against humanity in Article 6C. Crimes against humanity, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against civilian populations before or during the war, or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whether the country were perpetrated. How ironic is it that these obvious criminal wartime acts were not only perpetrated by the children of Israel, but were commanded or condoned by their God? In the Old Testament time frame being considered the God of the universe is instructing man how to act and behave. This instruction is not infused with love and morality. Rather, it instructs the children of Israel quite well on how to efficiently perpetrate genocide, murder, and barbarism. It kind of goes without saying that murder is dead wrong, but some people, especially Christians, attribute this understanding to God's commandments as if he's the only source for ethics and morality, and without it there would be nothing to stop people from murdering whoever they wanted to, which just let me say right now is quite disturbing. But we'll talk more about that later. For right now, let's discuss some of the well-known commandments and some more obscure ones to get a good picture of how God feels about killing innocent people. I think most everyone is familiar with the commandment in Exodus 20:13. Thou shalt not murder. Murder is a sin. But in Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 19, God also describes shedding innocent blood as an abomination, something If a person was found slain in a field, then the elders of all the nearby cities had to measure exactly who was the closest to the body, and the elders of that city were required to perform a ritual and sacrifice by way of breaking a heifer's neck and washing their hands over it in order to remove any possible blood guiltiness from their midst. God felt very strongly about murder, 
But as we will see in the next few passages, he clearly commands his people to ruthlessly kill men, women, and children on a genocidal scale. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were promised a land by God, a land that was already inhabited. By God's instruction, inhabitants of the land of their inheritance were completely destroyed by the Israelites, men, women, children, and livestock. The Israelites were instructed that nothing breathing be allowed to live. Other outlying cities not directly in the promised land had a choice to surrender into slavery or face war in which all the males were killed, but the women, children, and cattle, all the other spoils of war were plundered. Not incidentally after their older male family members were murdered, recently orphaned females of sufficient age were also sexually exploited as a result of the genocide perpetrated by the Israelites. But we'll discuss this in length in the next video regarding the value of a woman. Prior to deconversion, I personally distanced myself from these stories. I just accepted the fact that the adults were facing a death penalty and trusted that God had a really good reason because He knew all of their hearts and He could be sure of their guilt. I couldn't deal with the deaths of the children, so I never really allowed myself to think on it. I knew in the context of my previous religion that because of their innocence, they were going to heaven, and that thought sugarcoated their inhumane, abhorrent, and grievous murder. Now let's discuss the biblical justifications for murder and genocide. Why did all those innocent human beings die? Why were children and babies killed by the edge of a sword, no less? Looking in the Bible, there are at least three reasons that God gives to justify the carnage. God cites the promise he made to Abraham, judgment against the pagan practices of the Canaanites, and keeping the Israelites safe from the temptation of paganism, thereby keeping them pure and holy. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we find God's promise to Abraham. Little did Abraham know, God would kill thousands upon thousands of men, women, and children in order to keep his promise. In Leviticus, it's quite clear that not only is God giving them the land as Abraham's inheritance, but also the Jews were to be his hand of judgment against the people in the land who were sacrificing their own children to pagan gods. It's no wonder so many are dumbfounded or outraged at the atrocities man will commit against each other in the name of religion. In Deuteronomy, we find God revealing the third reason for the full-scale slaughter of the Canaanites. He did not want his holy people being defiled by these pagans. Sound like any other homicidal maniac we know? God says himself he is a jealous God. He commands his people that they should have no other gods before him. The possibility of Israel being influenced by another culture dwelling among them was too great a chance to take, so he removed the problem by commanding them to remove the people off the face of the earth, leaving nothing breathing alive problem taken care of. Unfortunately, Israel failed to fully wipe out the Canaanites and eventually would be influenced by their religion. If you have sufficient intestinal fortitude, you might want to check out the book of Lamentations, which details the horrible things that came to pass when God sent Babylon in to enslave them for their disobedience. Please watch the second half of An Honest Search for the Truth, Part 2, Murder and Genocide in the Old Testament where we will analyze biblical justification and common Christian defenses for this controversial topic.